Hey y'all, today I'm gonna to be talking about update strategies for edge devices. This can be a deceptively difficult problem to solve for, especially if you're dealing with a fleet of devices with different capabilities, but there are some tools and design strategies we can implement that address a number of pain points. First, a little bit about me. My name is Kat Cosgrove, and for about a year, I was a software engineer on the IoT team here at JFrog before I moved into developer advocacy. Our goal is to bring DevOps to the edge because it should not still be this difficult to update these devices. And in pursuit of this goal, we found a lot of interesting solutions that we could bring into a CI CD pipeline for embedded Linux devices and eventually built a rather flashy proof of concept that put several of these solutions on display. Let's get a little bit of context first. Just how large is the edge? Counting both dumb sensor edge devices or smarter ones and gateways, there are an estimated 20.4 billion edge devices today. It seems like a lot, yeah. So how are they being updated now? Some of them can't be updated. They are throwaway devices, uh, effectively single use. When they break, they need to be replaced. And a lot of those that are being updated do it in a way that's kind of unwieldy. Uh, it's time consuming or the infrastructure to support it is complicated or it can't happen wirelessly at all and requires physical access, which is either expensive for the manufacturer because they have to have staff to physically send out there to support the devices, or it's irritating for the user. Uh, users don't want to plug a device in to update it anymore, which is you know fair. I don't disagree. But in spite of that, the industry is clearly booming. Like it's 20.4 billion devices. That's not small. That's, that's not a small, insignificant industry. Clearly, in spite of the fact that they can't really be updated well for the most part, it's making money. So why should we spend the time and effort to change something that doesn't really appear to be a barrier to success? It is really inconvenient. It's not like small inconvenient. Our lives are increasingly reliant on edge and IoT computing with devices taking over larger and larger amounts of work in consumer, industrial, retail and medical spaces. A lot of you probably work in those industries and are very aware of that. People don't want to spend lengthy amounts of time waiting for a software update to complete in an increasing number of parts of their lives, you know, and they definitely don't want to have to plug the device into a computer to do it manually. It's also dangerous. Infrequent or non-existent software updates, regardless of the reason for it, makes edge devices a serious security vulnerability in anybody's network. Your, your consumers, your clients, a business network, a home network, it is a problem. Everyone knows that unpatched software is a problem. This could mean allowing anything from the exposure of user client data to a malicious third party, to devices being harnessed for a botnet or cryptocurrency mining. This has already happened on a wide scale and it's continuing to happen to today. The safety implications for medical are even more extreme, but remember a few years ago when a bunch of people's uh, smart home appliances, like their smart refrigerator and whatever, they, they got harnessed to be used as part of a botnet that was DDoSing other services because they, they were exposed and they were difficult to update. That's really dangerous. Okay, we're acknowledging that it's a problem. Uh, why are we not fixing this problem? Like, like, why does this still exist? We are flat out still not building for it. So a lot of these devices are just not designed with the ability to be updated. They expect to run the same software version they shipped with until they break. The update strategy for these devices is flashing them. This is dangerous because how often do you write a piece of software with zero bugs in it? How confident are you and your QA team to catch every conceivable edge case? I know we all want to think that we're like, we're wizards, we're like, super reliable, masters of our craft, 
genius 10x engineers, but that's not reality. It just isn't because you really, you just shouldn't be that confident. There are on average between one and 25 bugs per thousand lines of code. Bugs are making it into production. You can't gamble on your code being perfect because you're not perfect. None of us are, sorry. We also can't really rely on the device's network. Uh, the networks hosting these devices are probably unstable. Uh, the connections might be intermittent. The speed of the network may be very slow. So we need to keep the updates really, really, really small, which probably need, means they need to happen more frequently. And it's also probably not a secure network. So these updates need to be signed in some way so we know they're trustworthy. Those 20.4 billion devices are also not running on any kind of standardized hardware. Each class of device is running on something specialized with differences in available communication protocols, memory, storage space, architecture, and operating system sophistication. So how do we design a system that takes these differences into account, handles them, and allows us to achieve easier deployments to broader classes of devices instead of just a single board or device type? Can we get a one-size-fits-all solution for a market that comes in a lot of different sizes? Probably not. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, but we can build something that gets us one-size-fits-most or at least something that's flexible enough that it can be applied to your specific situation with minimal effort. First, we have to think about the future. We need to stop building devices that can't be updated. Throwaway devices are not acceptable anymore. Besides the glaring security problem and having a fleet of devices out there in the wild collecting data that can't be patched if there's a problem, the ecological impact of designing single-use electronics that might need to be just thrown away as a result of a bug is unacceptable. The way I like to explain to people how many of these like crappy single-use electronics out there there are is uh, the Tokyo Olympics were supposed to happen this summer. All of the medals for the Tokyo Olympics were made entirely from scrap metal harvested from discarded electronics donated by the people of Japan. That is an absolutely mind-boggling amount of electronic trash that we should not allow to continue. It's absolutely unacceptable. We also need to be designing with the philosophy that your product should improve over the course of its usable lifespan. This may not apply to edge devices that are just dumb arrays of sensors passing data along somewhere else, but it definitely applies to smarter edge devices and gateways. The expected lifespan of some edge devices is five to 10 years. They should not be getting worse from the very moment they ship. And now I'm not saying that you need to build something that's never going to need to be replaced because that's not how businesses work, but you shouldn't allow it to immediately degrade. You should be able to improve it for as long as the hardware is not obsolete, you know? So release updates to improve your physical product for, I'm not asking for a decade, I'm asking for a couple of years. Support it with measurable improvements until the hardware is obsolete, and then people will replace it. We also need to be building more robustly. Uh, brittle software means a brittle product, and your users aren't going to trust that. So a bad update should never brick the device. There needs to be a way to roll back immediately if there is a problem. Be trustworthy. And there are a lot of moving parts in deploying updates to the edge or deploying updates at all these days, but especially to edge devices. And it's much easier to manage for the developer if you have a robust CI CD pipeline in place. Just do your engineers a favor and don't make them do all of this like menial, repetitive stuff every single time. Automate it. Let's talk about the proof of concept in question. For Swamp Up last summer, my team built a proof of concept demonstrating fast, reliable, over-the-air updates for edge devices. We went with a car as our example because it's flashy, and it's not something a lot of us think of as an IoT or edge device, even though it, it totally is. Most cars these days have 
at least two or three computers in them, uh, the infotainment system plus a computer for the transmission and the brakes at, at minimum. So it's, it's a data center on wheels and all those, com all those computers on board, they need updates. Since JFrog wouldn't buy us a real car to potentially brick during testing, which is fair, uh, I'm not mad at you for that, Shlomi, we had to build our own, inspired by a hackathon I had run a few months earlier. So we had a racing simulator set up in the middle of a large track, complete with a pedal, a wheel, a screen for the driver, a racing chair, and a green screen around the track so they had something nice to look at. That is me making sure it's everything is set up before the conference opens. We allowed people to interact with it in one of two ways. As a developer, writing and pushing updates for the car or driving the car while someone else updated it. Uh, yes, we really did let like real randos off of the conference center floor <laughs> write code and push it to our demo. We were very, very confident in this. Uh, it actually only was a problem once. But what we found was that usually somebody from marketing wanted to be the developer and get like help from one of us. And uh, the developer wanted to drive the car. And then the person from marketing wanted to mess with the developer by pushing an update that like made the steering really loose or inverted the video or something. It was, uh, it was fun for everybody. But the car itself is just a heavily modified donkey car. If you aren't familiar with those, and I was not before I ran a hackathon with one, it's a miniature RC car that's been modified with a Raspberry Pi and a camera. The library that enables it to do its thing is called Donkey, hence Donkey Cars. Uh, in its most basic form, uh, you can build one for about $250 in parts and a couple of hours of your time. It's really not bad. Once everything's set up, you record 10 laps or so on a track marked with uh, like brightly colored masking tape or paper on a dark floor. Really, you need anything that creates a lot of contrast. Like you can see here, we painted uh, stripes on a black floor. Uh, then you just dump the recorded images and steering data back to your computer, train a model, and then hand it back to the car. Uh, Donkey provides a CLI that makes all of this really, really, really easy, but the project itself is super well documented. So if you want to dig in a little deeper and make some modifications to it, you totally can. Uh, they are pretty fun. A whole community exists for modifying and racing these things. They'll throw bigger batteries on them, more powerful motors, uh, nicer wheels, and then just race. <laughs> it's really cool. The standard camera is just a regular Raspberry Pi cam, but some folks do add a second camera for stereo vision or a LiDAR camera for better depth perception. Ours was a little bit beefier than the standard, but still not by much. We just swapped out the Raspberry Pi 3B for a 3B plus with a compute module. So it was it's very nearly a stock donkey car. You can build this too. Uh, while the interactive part of the demo wasn't as revolutionary from a technical standpoint, it was really fun to build and still fairly complicated. Uh, I am happy to answer questions about this part of the demo as well, but let's talk about the actual software updates. How are cars being updated now? Uh, so the overwhelming majority of cars can't receive software updates over the air. I know like somebody listening to this drives a Tesla and is going well, actually, yes, I know Tesla can do it, but we're not talking about Teslas. We're talking about most cars. So most cars need to be brought into a service center to get a software update and it can take a long time. Cars that can be updated over the air, which again are in the minority, uh, still take a while to do it. it. It still can sometimes take hours and the car can't drive while any part of that is going on. Different cars are still using different boards and running on different operating systems. So even within one corner of the market, there is no standardization yet. And something like 15% of vehicle recalls are a result of bad software that needs to be updated. For example, a couple of years ago, Jaguar had to issue a recall to fix a problem with the brakes on one of its cars, one of its very expensive luxury cars. And another car stranded its owner in the car on the highway for hours because it could do over-the-air updates, but it wasn't very intelligent about how it handled them 
and it couldn't roll back a bad one. So this poor person was just trapped in their car on the highway for hours during in traffic. That's like my actual nightmare. So this is a very real, very painful and very potentially dangerous issue that presented us with a range of solvable problems for both the end user and the manufacturer. The combination of all of these issues in one single device made it a great example for proving that we do not have to do things this way anymore. Because we were working with a car, we were very, very motivated to make this happen quickly, reliably, and without the potential for injury to the user. I know that it wasn't a real car, but we were pretending that little RC car was a real car. Let's look at our workflows and tools. We use two distinct workflows showing off two distinct strategies for the proof of concept. For one workflow, we updated the software running on the car without flashing its firmware. It's very quick, it doesn't interrupt the user, and it supports rollbacks. This workflow relied on K3S and Helm. For the other, we updated the firmware itself in just minutes with the ability to automatically roll back if something goes wrong once again. And this one relied on Mender, Yocto, and Artifactory. All the updates are scanned for vulnerabilities using X-ray, and pipelines can manage the triggering of different events. We'll look at the software workflow first. This is just a quick overview of the technologies at play in a workflow for software updates on a device. We use JFrog Artifactory to manage and store all of our various build artifacts, as well as handle promoting builds from development to production. X-Ray is used to scan our package dependencies before release. We want to make sure that we're not accidentally pushing like a known security problem. K3S and Helm are used to deploy to the car. Since it already integrates with JFrog products, JFrog pipelines would be used to orchestrate all of this. We'll talk about each tool individually in a little more detail. Uh, K3S is just Kubernetes, but five less. It's also the cutest slogan in open source. I love it. And K3S is really just lightweight Kubernetes. It's designed for edge devices, uses only 512 megabytes of RAM, produces a binary of just 40 megabytes, and has very, very minimal OS requirements. The package's required dependencies are just container D, Flannel, core DNS, CNI, and some utilities like IP tables and SOCAT. Uh, it's wrapped in a launcher that abstracts away some of the more complex issues like generating TLS certificates for secure communications, and it sets a few options for you. Then we also relied on Helm, uh, the package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, I assume that a lot of you are familiar with Helm already, but for the people in the room who are not, I will go over it briefly. Helm uses charts to describe complex applications and allows for an easily repeatable and predictable installation. Your charts serve as the final authority on what your application should look like. They're also easy to version and support rollbacks if something goes wrong. This is part of one of the Helm charts for this demo. If you've never seen Helm chart syntax before, it's building a microservice we were using to allow us to control the miniature car with a racing wheel designed for video games. The syntax here is fairly simple. Like all things in DevOps, ultimately it is just YAML. Rub some YAML on it. The result is using these tools, these just two special open source tools, uh, made updates to the applications running on the car pretty quick and fairly efficient. The average amount of time from a developer pushing an update to deployment on the car was about 35 seconds with no interruption to the user at all. It can happen while the device is in use. That's not to say that it necessarily should happen while the device is in use. In the case of a, a car, I don't really think in actual practice it should. Um, and for most updates, I think there should be consent from the user involved, or we should at least tell them that it happened. But designing your edge device with this strategy in mind does mean you can update silently. For edge devices without any user act interaction at all and no need for a full firmware update, this is probably a pretty compelling option if you're building a an HVAC system, a smart HVAC system or something that 
people aren't really going to want or need to mess with on a regular basis, this is probably a, a good option for you. Next, we'll take a look at the firmware workflow. This one was a little bit more complicated. Similar to the software workflow, this is an overview of what is going on in the firmware update workflow. Yocto is used to create our builds. We have pipelines handling all of the events again and X-Ray checking our packages for vulnerabilities or policy violations. We're also using Artifactory again, but this time for more than just storing binaries. It's handling some of the workload for Yocto, storing its build cache to make things faster later on. Mender is used to handle over-the-air deployment. So let's talk about Mender a little bit over-the-air updates for embedded Linux devices. Mender ticks several of the boxes we're looking for. It, all the updates are cryptographically signed and verified. It supports automatic rollbacks to a previous build if a failure occurs. And it allows for several distinct installation strategies. But I'm going to be focusing on the dual AB strategy. Using this method, two partitions exist on the device, A and B. Duh. The bootloader is aware of which partition is currently designated as active and which is not. It boots into the partition designated active. During an update, the inactive partition is updated with your new firmware. It streams directly there to the inactive partition. And at this point, the partition running the update is designated as active. And on reboot, the bootloader flips into that partition instead. Because the partition running the older software still exists, although now it's designated as inactive, Mender offers us an additional layer of security. If there is an issue with the new build that wasn't caught in earlier testing and prevents it from booting correctly, Mender can autom automatically roll back to the previous version by just switching to the inactive partition. So what this would look like in practice is uh, you, you get in the car, you're driving to the grocery store, while you're driving to the grocery store, your car gets an update and it starts streaming to uh, partition B. We'll say that's the inactive one for now. Uh, so it downloads to partition B while you're driving to the grocery store. This does not interrupt you at all. You don't notice. Aside from maybe your car saying, hey, you've got an update. Do you want to go ahead and download this? You say yes. It You drive to the grocery store. It doesn't interrupt you other than that. So you go in, you do your shopping, you come back out, load up your groceries, and then you turn on the car and you drive home and that's it. So while the update may have actually taken the entire 15 minutes it took you to drive to the grocery store, the perception from the user is that it happened instantaneously the next time they rebooted the car. So that's pretty cool in and of itself. The use of Mender's AB strategy alone adds a lot of additional speed and security to your edge deployments but we still need to address the issue of the size of our builds because they're kind of big. Enter the Yocto project, providing custom Linux distributions for any hardware architecture. Yocto drastically reduces resources used on the board and minimizes hardware requirements by building a distribution without certain modules that are unnecessary for your particular hardware. For instance, say you know you're only ever gonna have to communicate over Bluetooth you build a custom Linux distribution that does not include modules for Ethernet and Wi-Fi, just isn't there from the very beginning. BitBake is used to write recipes for your build, pulling in layers for different hardware configurations and applications. We used a layer for the board itself, a Raspberry Pi 3B+, as well as layers for K3S and Mender. Uh, Yocto already provides a pretty wide variety of hardware layers for common configurations to get you started more quickly. And custom layers can be written to isolate specific applications or behaviors if you want. As an example, this is part of the meta layer that adds K3S to our Yocto build. BitBake syntax is pretty straightforward, and it allows for the execution of both Python and shell scripts in parallel. You don't need to be an expert in Python or shell scripting for this. It's all uh, fairly simplified. So any software engineer with sufficient drive could absolutely put this together. The first build will still take a while, but we can speed things up drastically for future builds. 
Yocto caches everything it downloads during a build, which allows it to do incremental updates. If you have it use this build cache, it'll only rebuild what's changed. And this is where Artifactory comes into play. We can use a generic repository to store the Yocto build cache and tell Yocto to use that during subsequent builds. This strategy reduces the time required to build by as much as 50% for us. That's a pretty significant speed difference. So the result is using Mender to handle deployments and Yocto for our builds when pulling the build cache from Artifactory, the time for a full firmware update was between five and 10 minutes after the first build. The build is as small as possible, minimizing potential issues with low bandwidth on the device's network. The updates are signed, satisfying a security requirement and automatic rollbacks are in place in case of a failure. So we succeeded. I do have a few more tools that didn't make it into our proof of concept, but are still very much worth mentioning. First is OS tree. It's uh, basically Git for operating systems. Like Git, OS tree is using a content addressed object store with branches to track meaningful file trees. Uh, this can be used to update a system even incrementally and also supports rollbacks. There is a Yocto meta layer for this as well that allows over the air updates using OS tree and actualizer. Uh, and OS tree is already used by a few different Linux distributions. This is a well established tool. Uh, there's no real reason why we chose Mender over OS tree other than just we came across Mender first, I think. Next is Lava, a testing framework for operating systems on embedded devices. Lava stands for Linaro Automation and Validation Architecture, and it's a continuous integration system for deploying operating systems onto physical and virtual hardware to run tests. Uh, tests can be simple boot testing, uh, bootloader testing, or system level testing, and results are tracked over time and data can be exported for further analysis. Uh, we have this running in the lab in the Seattle office. Lava was designed for validation during development, though, testing whether code that engineers are producing works in whatever sense that means for you. Uh, depending on context, this could be testing whether changes in the Linux kernel compile and boot or whether the code produced by GCC is smaller or faster. Uh, Lava is outstanding at device management with templates in place for more than 100 boards. If you need a device type that Lava doesn't already know how to support, custom devices can be added, although it can be difficult to fully integrate an unknown device. I will admit that the learning curve with Lava is uh, is pretty steep, but it's, it's worth it if you need to manage a ton of different boards, uh, a ton of just different boards. All right, let's recap. The way a lot of Edge and IoT devices are being updated now, if at all, is kind of broken. It's a gigantic security flaw that needs to be addressed. It doesn't have to be this way. We have technology available literally right now that handles some of these problems beautifully. For edge devices running embedded Linux, a modern DevOps pipeline and a handful of open source tools can make it as easy to deploy updates and security patches to your edge devices as it is to any other application. If you only need to update applications running on the device, K3S and Helm can make things very quick and easy for you. I know Kubernetes has a pretty steep learning curve. I was scared of it at first too, but uh, K3S is simpler to use, I promise. If you need to update the device's firmware itself, consider Yocto and Mender or OS tree. Definitely store the Yocto build cache in Artifactory and make sure Yocto is actually set up to use it. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me today. I hope I brought you some useful information or at least an interesting perspective. If you have questions, I'll be in the chat answering them for a while. And you can also reach me on Twitter at Dixie3Flatline, or you can just shoot me an email at catc at jfrog.com. Enjoy the rest of the conference.